think at the lowest level, they send people on errands. They play with people's minds. They sway people to do things and think certain ways so that we stay in conflict, focused on ourselves. So that we're always cleaning house or losing weight or dressing up for other people. I think they get inside our heads and make us do destructive things like drink and overeat. I've seen good people go bad and smart people go mad. I think at the highest level, they do things that cause nations to go to war, things that make no sense. And I think no one knows they're being affected we all work out other reasons to justify our actions. But free will is impossible with them up there. Highly evolved creatures living in the sky taking an active interest in human welfare. Why would they? I think they feel sorry for us. Try to imagine it. Advanced beings living alongside humans throughout history. Watching our wars, our famines, observing our unbelievable cruelty, our unbelievable stupidity. Two movie clips for ya. The first from the recent film, The Vast of the Night, and the other from Philip K. Dick's Radio Free Album, which gets better with each view and is eerily prescient of our current dystopian degenerate times. Both clips reveal the two sides of what our alien overlords might be. Are they evil? Are they beneficial? Are they both? Well, I can tell you that it's a busy universe out there, and in this eternal now our astral guests will support this, exposing a cosmic hierarchy of galactic and interdimensional extraterrestrials that have all been all Jupiter ascending-like since they created humanity as their playthings. And like the Moloch elite today, hide things in plain sight like our religion, government, and art. Satellite's been up there for thousands of years. What the ancient Hebrews were to Egypt and the early Christians were to Rome, we are now to this corrupt new American empire. It's an ancient fight, Nick. The values of the individual against the supremacy of the state. That's why the confession kids, that's why the growing police supervision. Over half our organization's been discovered and eliminated. Aren't you afraid? <laughs> I would be, if it weren't for Fire Bright. That's how I refer to the plasmatic entity within me. It's like a little egg of silver, cold, pale fire glowing with life just right up here. It's a busy universe out there, and we Nosticoi are aware of this. Awake and alone, in full understanding, too, of the Herculean task of having to, yes, awaken others, expand our consciousness, and take those Icarian flights up the celestial spheres of reality, unreality, and hyperreality. Nothing is bloody change. As Oscar Wilde said, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at stars. And it's no secret the ancient Gnostics were all about breaking the fate of the Zodiac, daring astral travel, and passing through starry portals to make contact with an alien god that misplaced his wisdom and sometimes thought he was us. From the Ophites to the Mandeans, Gnosis has been the fuel to expose this busy universe and finally bring our imagination home. Can it be done, Father? Can a man change the stars? Yes, William. He believes enough a man can do anything. As Eric Davis wrote, We don't need to expiate our crimes, but to discover and remember the way out of a false world created through no fault of our own. And this way is way out. Gnostic texts crackle with a peculiar energy, an almost sci-fi sensibility of alien gods and supramundane universes of light. 
Though not the first cosmic dualists, the Gnostics may have been the first spiritual off-worlders. This place is designed to mess you up, to mess with your head. None of this is real. It's all just trials to test your heroic attributes. Hmm. Hmm. Now let's go get that book. Yeah, you're the smartest dog I know, man. Are you with me on this journey? You're at A.M. by Gnostic Radio. Are you ready to not just look at the stars from the gutter, but to go beyond them? Not exactly find answers, but more like find experiences that transform you into a divine being and allow you to mend a broken world? As Jungian analyst Joel Croker wrote, The ego wants an answer. The self doesn't care about answers. It just keeps living into the larger question. Always, always, always. Human beings make life so interesting. Do you know that in a universe so full of wonders, they have managed to invent boredom? Quite astonishing. Are you with me? Are you ready for the greatest adventure in all your lifetimes? A journey of fathoming what a busy universe it is. Accepting both its wonder and horror, and knowing to give it so much meaning the alien god finds its misplaced wisdom? For this task and our topic, we have the pleasure of being joined by Pierre Sabac, who materializes at the Virtual Alexandria to discuss his latest book, Holographic Culture. If you thought you knew all about ancient astronauts, chariots of the gods, the greys, and even the archons, think again, because Pierre's research is exhaustive and unparalleled, as you will see in our interview. Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! Heresy shouldn't be this much fun, but it just is. It just is. And so is going beyond the stars. What choice does anyone have anymore who wants to salvage their soul and sanity and dignity? As we come to the end of the world in these Gnostic times, Philip K. Dick world, and New Age of Hermes. What choice do we freaks and outcasts have as we rise with the god in the gutter of Philip K. Dick, holding on to that despised philosopher's stone buried in the mud? Well, it's not really a measure of mental health to be well-adjusted in a society that's very sick. We're fucking getting out, going beyond the stars like our ancestors, the first spiritual off-worlders. We're not escaping, but delivering our sister Sophia above all the galaxies because it's time she went home. Once she's home, we gain so much power. And like those first spiritual off-worlders, we will beautify the world with our daring, imagination, and humor. Maybe we won't be the change we want to see in the world, but we will be the strange we want to see in the world. You'll be in a better jail forever. Maybe we could share one. As Ursula Le Guin wrote, You cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It is in your spirit, or it is nowhere. Those without swords can still die upon them. I fear neither death nor pain. That's why we don't connect with the machinations of the god of this world, manifesting in so much astroturfing causes out there, from both left and right. Because we are with the god in the gutter and the misplaced Sophia. And the world hates us for this, just as it did the ancient Gnostics. As the late and self-described Gnostic Harold Bloom wrote, the societal consequences of debasing the Gnostic self into selfishness and the believer's freedom from others into the bondage of others are to be seen everywhere in our cities and in our agrarian wastelands. The enemies of Gnosis were and are triumphant 
but only in the organizational and political sense. Historically, they seem to have won, but all victories over the spirit remain forever equivocal, and the spark or deepest self is never quite snuffed out. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. We are the last stand in a world going dark, a busy universe full of hierarchies and high places that might be no better than Yaldi Baldi and his rapey technocrat angels. Or might be them, actually, as Pierre will explain in our interview. But we have become the revolution because the awakening of an individual is a cosmic event as well as a cosmic rebellion. If it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. Thanks for being here, for being yourself, and what you were meant to be, here in the desert of the real. Here in this red pill cafeteria. Here in hell and here in the gutter. Not just looking at the stars, but going beyond them. I have always been honored to serve you as you become your higher self. Why, Mr. Anderson? Why? Why do you persist? Because I choose to. And lastly, remember this. All of this is Gnosis, but Gnosis is not the result, but what brings the result. And what is the result? I think you know. I think you remember sometimes. The result is everything and nothing. What else would it be? Sophia's restoration is Gnosis, but the result is what Mary Magdalene says in the dialogue with the Savior. To be transparent to the transcendent. I am the beginning, the end, the one who is many. I bring order to chaos. Or as the Corpus Hermeticum, Chapter 8 states, O oh, Father, I have been made steadfast through God. I now see not with the eyes, but by the operational spiritual energy in the powers. I am in heaven, in earth, in water, in the air. I am in living creatures and plants. I am in the womb, before the womb, after the womb. I am present everywhere. To say yes to one instant is to say yes to all of existence. Remember that? Sometimes I do. Let's continue remembering together. And let us now to our interview with Pierre Sabac. First, there was a dream. Now, there is reality. Here, in the untainted cradle of the heavens, will be created a new super race, a race of perfect physical specimens. You have been selected as its progenitors. Like gods, your offspring will return to Earth and shape it in their image. You have all served in humble capacities in my terrestrial empire. Your seed, like yourselves, will pay deference to the ultimate dynasty which I alone have created. From their first day on earth, they will be able to look up and know that there is law and order in the heavens. For someone who was never meant for this world, I must confess, I'm suddenly having a hard time leaving it. Of course, they say every atom in our bodies was once part of a star. Maybe I'm not leaving. Maybe I'm going home.
This is the AM Byte interview, and with us, we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Pierre Sabac to discuss his book, Holographic Culture. Pierre, thank you for coming on the show, and how are you doing? Well, thank you, Miguel, for um, inviting me. It's, it's brilliant to be on your show at last. Um, I've seen your channel, and it's absolutely fantastic. And um, what's great is also you're representing British authors as well, so that's brilliant, Miguel. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yes, uh, by the grace of the guests go we, and we have great guests with so much to share about the reality of the world and the reality behind the reality, as Anthony Peake would say. But uh, with us, too, we also have, as always, the pleasure of having the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? I'm great. Looking forward to a very fascinating show with a lot of things that I've been interested in over the years. And having them tied all together. So can't wait. Let's go. Oh, yes. This is a topic that uh, you've been studying for much longer than I have, and you have uh, great expertise, so you'll enjoy it. And a lot of our audience are very interested in this material, too. So, But, Pierre, let's start with you and how you became interested in these uh, heterodox topics. Tell us about yourself, your journey into being involved in alternative research. In your book, you do talk about being a kid and seeing a rocket flying. Is that how it began, more or less? Yeah, that's basically it. Um, when I was a child, I saw a rocket in a, in a field when I was staying over at my grandmother's. Um, and this uh, rocket, it took off at a right angle, and it kind of flew high over my head. And uh, I went inside, and I said to my grandma, I've, I've just seen a rocket. And she said, yeah, sure, what would you like for tea kind of thing. Uh, but that incident really stuck with me. And, and from then on, I really became profoundly interested in the subject of extraterrestrial life, flying saucers. And I also had an interest in ghosts and the paranormal. But it, it, I think that, it, that experience, it, it really stemmed from that experience. And um, then, I mean, when I became older, I started to read a lot of esoteric material. And this kind of fed in with what I studied at university, because um, at university I was studying fine art, and the academic component of the course was based on semiotics, which is the study of signs, which really, when you begin to break it down, is the deconstruction of um, the symbol. And so other authors which I really became enamored with and in which I became interested with were authors such as um, David Icke, which looked at the symbolism of the serpent. I also became interested in another author, uh, a British author called Robert Temple, and he wrote a, a fascinating book called The Serious Mystery. And uh, this essentially was looking at the Dogon people and the representation of the reptile in relation to Sirius. And in particular, it was looking at the ancient astronaut theory, um, but it was looking at it from an academic perspective. And, and this is certainly something that I wanted to try and approach within my work. I really wanted to get back to the um, academic center um, within the study of what is known um, as aritology, which is the study of writings about divine beings. And so I really began to study this, and I began to study it in, in depth. And uh, what really became evident to me was that the um, an, an angiological tradition is uh, related to the ufological tradition. And although, obviously, authors like Van Dyneken had established, let's say, a correlation, and certainly, shall we say, good circumstantial evidence uh, that there was a correlation, I really wanted to go back and, and really to nail this and to pin this. And uh, to my surprise, when I began to look into this, the, the old field began to open up. And uh, I, I named this field a scaphology. And I think that this in itself is it underpins everything that I write about scaphology because scaphology is the study of angelic boats within religion and mythology. And I think that this might actually surprise your uh, listeners because um, the angels themselves are represented as sailors. And we'll go into this in a little later on in which we can go through the etymologies and demonstrate emphatically that the angels correlate with sailors. And these sailors when we begin to break it down, um, they fly in circular vessels. And really, this is the progenitor of what is the ufological tradition. So in essence, the scaphological tradition is synonymous uh, with the ufological tradition. So that that's basically a summary and, and the basis of where I began and a very generalization of my work. Well, thank you for that. Yes, for the audience, his book is exhaustive. It's so much evidence. Pierre brings graphs, pictures of art, yeah. and ties yeah, it all there. To. So it's almost like a textbook. You can see how everything's broken down and everything else. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I illustrated the book because um, I studied fine art. So um, that, that was another part of the book, which was the, the creative endeavor, if, if you like. Um, but also I've tried to put um, things into tables. In my first book, The Murder of Reality, it was looking at the serpent agena, the serpent race, and the occult symbolism behind the mystery schools. Um, but again, it was chasing the etymologies and the words. And I really wanted to try and structure that a little bit more in my second book and break this down into tables so that the reader could look at the tables and the comparative etymologies, um, the study of words, and say, yes, that's basically, I, I can see that the sailor is a symbol of the angel. So that was um, that was my intention. Yeah, good job. And of course, there's so many hierarchies in your book, and you can read this, but when you start seeing how everything's structured, uh, well, you, you see an army, you see a, a complete organization above us, but which we want to get into. But yeah. you were talking about symbolism and etymology there's a quote uh, towards the end of your book that i really like and it goes i like to compare symbolism to a game of chess after the first two moves you have over seventy thousand combinations right okay yes i think that's right that this is another thing which i really need to impress upon the listener because uh, when we're dealing with symbolism, there's a tendency, and particularly this is for uh, those who are not literate within the discourse of the symbol, there's, there's a tendency just to think that the, uh, let's say, the, the solar iconography of the sun is a representation of the light. Yes, at one level it is, but also it can represent Sirius, it can represent the opening wheels, it can represent the watchers. So the symbol itself is layered. And in fact, when we look at the symbol, it really is like an encyclopedic um, book of information. So one symbol um, it, within this symbol is compacted multiple meanings. And really, the symbologist is trying to unpack what those meanings are. And when we look at the symbol, we find that the symbol is primarily linguistic based. I mean, there are different variations of symbols, such as numerical symbols, alphanumeric, geometria, astrology, astronomy. Uh, these are all symbolic components. And so the symbol itself as a science, um, is a very complex science because it goes into multiple discourses, into multiple disciplines. Um, but yet, yeah, the symbol is layered. And so, really, today, what I would like the view, uh, the listener, to um, take home with them is the fact that the symbol is very diverse, and that the symbol is often it often encodes multiple ideas, and some of these ideas can be contrary or contradictory. And this is reverse symbolism, which I refer to in my book as duplex symbolism. So this is the reversal of the signifier. And I think that this becomes particularly um, relevant when we're looking at what are known as the seraphim, which are the non-human angels, and their relationship to the cherubim, which I describe as the proto-human angels. And basically, in the occult tradition, you have the dialectic, which is I refer to as the seraphim cherubim dialectic and essentially this is knowledge which is partitioned within the priesthood um, between the seraphic components which are these non-human angels which are aliens and then the cherubic or um, cherubim which are the proto-human angels and um, within occult philosophy this is known as the pythagorean euclidean dialectic so for example if we took the name of pythagoras Puthonagoras means a speaker of the serpent. The serpent in this respect is the dragon or the seraphim, which is the non-human angel. And then you've got Euclid who wrote the elements of geometry. Um, and Euclid's name is a diptych paranomasi. Now that's a big word and it's a special wordplay. It's basically a wordplay from the um, Arabic or from one language into a different language. So Euclid in Greek, Euclides, which is good glory, is a wordplay on the Arabic Euclid, which is to copy or to ape. Now, to copy or to ape is referring to mathematics because the elements of geometry, they copy or mimic the um, physical world. But the etymology of Euclid, Euclid to ape or to copy, is coming from the Arabic stem, curd, which is an ape. And so the ape is used as an esoteric um, signifier of, um, of the cherubim and the humanist tradition. Now, the seraphim cherubim um, dialectic is represented within Freemasonry as the two pillars of Freemasonry. And this is essentially going into the tradition of what I describe as a parallel society. The parallel society is this discourse between humans and um, angels. And, and so this is something which is very interesting. And it goes all the way back into the ancient world, into um, what I describe as the saucer cults, which is the v worship and the veneration of um, angelic ships and angelic vessels. 
Well, well said. Yes, we want to unpack some of this and go deeper. Sure. But first, why don't we talk about the problem today? And this is something you definitely address in your book, Holographic Culture. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, well, the issue with ufology today. As you write, uh, we are somehow taught to believe that flying saucers and UFOs just popped out of nowhere in the middle of the 20th century. Is that it? <laughs> well, that's, th- this is exactly right. And I think that this is really a problem because UFOlogy hasn't really moved on since the 1970s. And since really Jacques Vallée, I mean, Jacques Vallée talked about the control structure. And again, his work is extremely interesting and there's a lot of merit within his work. Mm-hmm. Um, but we must also realize that the UFO itself is very ancient. And this goes back to what I described as a scaphological tradition, uh, which is the study of these angelic boats and ships within the religious and mythological tradition. And I think that this is really where we now to now need to get a little bit technical because it's okay just to say, well, yeah, UFOs and angels are one and the same thing, but the audience are going to want proof. And the proof is found within what I describe as the artifact. Now, the artifact is the alien code found within human languages. And this code um, is basically symbolism. So it's this hidden discourse, which in the Greek is idioglossolalia, which is this private discourse, uh, which is shared amongst the adepts, or who I refer to as the disciparati. Now, the disciparati literally means the deceivers. But the word disciparati is coming from the etymology of a disciple, So a disciple is actively deceived. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why am I drawing a correlation with the disciparati? But I think that when we're looking at the ufological tradition, it's very much looking, um, it's very much similar to looking, let's say, at ancient mythology, because ancient mythology was encoded in allegory. Alasagoria. Alasagoria means other speaking. But what do we mean by other speaking? Well, alos is referring to alos genes, which is an alien. Now, the term alos genes or xenos is used in the Greek as it was used in the Aramaic to refer to an uh, an angel. So, in both in Greek and in Aramaic, the word angel is synonymous with an alien. And so, this is something that we're not really taught at Sunday school that the angels are a metonym for an alien. And so. This is something which we uh, really need to look into. So I'm going to give you a few etymologies now just to try and um, substantiate the proposition uh, that the angel is synonymous with a a, a sailor. So, for example, um, in the Hebrew and in the Arabic, Malak and angel is a polymorphic symbol. In other words, um, Malak is um, as a multiple meaning. Malak also means Malak, which is a sailor. And this is because the angels were represented as crew members of naval vessels. And this is certainly borne out within, let's say, the name of Yahweh Seboeth. Yahweh Seboeth is the Lord of the host. Now, the word Seboeth is broken down as Saba, which is an army, but this um, particularly is related to a naval host or a naval itinerant. So there is, for example, Seboeth, Saba, an army, Sefer, which is a serpent, which is related to a seraph. So Sefer for serpent. Um, but again, Seboeth is related to Saba and Taba, which is an ark or a vessel. Now, this is important because Yahweh Seboeth is the lord of the naval host. And in, indeed, he's actually the lord of the seraphic host. Hence the correlation between Saba and Sefer, which is a viper. Um, again, which is a close cognate of Seraph, which is a non-human angel. So... These angels are equated with what we would describe as flying saucers. Now, the ancient Aramaic word for a flying saucer is the ophanim wheels. Okay, so the word um, ophan is coming from pana, which is to turn or to spin. So this is a spinning wheel, which are equated with angelic messengers. Essentially, they're emissaries from uh, naval vessels, which are equated with heaven. So, and, and, but we're also, what's very interesting is that when we begin to break this down, as I, Im, as I inferred um, in, in the beginning, I said that there were two types of angels which are related to the Pythagorean Euclidean tradition. So we have the seraphim and we have the cherubim. The seraphim are non human angels, the cherubim are proto human angels. Now, the etymology of seraph a serpent is related to sapan, which is a sailor and Safina, which is a ship. But again, we're finding the same etymologies with a cherubim because cherub, an angel, a human angel, is related to carib, which is um, a a vessel. So again, we're seeing that the angels are represented as um, mariners or sailors of heaven. So that's um, a a quick summary, if you like, 
of the angelic sailors and how they um, interrelate both within the humanist tradition and then the alien or seraphic tradition, which is this um, dialectic which is found within within um, the sciences, within academia. Um, it, it is at the basis of Western philosophy. And indeed, when you actually look at um, Taoism, for example, yin and yang, uh, you've got the tiger and the dragon, which are combined together within, within the yin and yang insignia uh, within the babylonian um, insignias this would be the lion and the serpent but essentially it's representing the same idea the lion is a mammal and the serpent is this uh, non-human or serpentine entity uh, which is related to this discourse or the dialectic which is found um, encoded within the artifact which is human language um, this alien code um, found within language which is um, if you like revealed through symbolism and is layered and is nuanced so the answer you're talking about there's two types uh again for the audience so they get a clear mm. picture you say non-human and proto-human non-human proto -human. What, what are the difference between a non-human and a proto-human okay uh well the human angels which you would describe as adamic angels are the ishim now the ishim is coming from the etymology of ish which means man so they are human angels. So essentially you have uh, what I describe, well, essentially you have the partition, which is the parallel society and the parallel society is represented through um, the state or the, the, um, uh, the ship of state. Again, the government, gubernatio, is to steer a ship, um, and, and from kubernau, which is to steer a vessel. Um, a Greek, in the Greek, a minister is, um, Eretz, um, which, which is a rower, is coming from Uperetz, which is a minister. So this idea of steering a vessel is equated with the angelic host because heaven and earth are mirrored together. And in the symbolism, earth is tied or moored to an angelic vessel. The angelic vessel are the host. In the Greek, stratos and army, uh, the word host is an invading or um, invading army, which is found within the Latin. Um, so there is this um, correspondence, if you like, between human angels, which are the Ishim, and then the Cherubim, which are the proto-human angels. Now, the proto-human angels, um, th their seed um, remodeled the Adamic um, races. So this, this is important to actually understand. So the Adamic races are tweaked from, uh, um, from the proto-human. Uh, the proto-human is equated to the Pleiades. Uh, the symbolism for that is is vast, and that's something which I'm currently writing about at the moment. So that's not that's not something that I'm going to go in um, to at the moment, just because the symbology is, is very complex. Yeah, it makes certain sense. But basically, okay, I I, sh I should mention this actually. Uh, when we're dealing with the Adamic man, uh, the listener may ask, well, why was the Adamic man created? Now, my understanding of this, and obviously, I'm not in the circle of knowledge. And, and by that, I'm using the word circle to refer to the opening wheels. Um, I'm not initiated. And again, I don't believe in initiation because this is concealing knowledge, which is our heritage. And we have a right to understand this and we have a right to know about this because this impacts upon uh, politics, the ship of state, um, the um, kingships as well. The word kingship um, is denoting that the line of the king is angelic. So this is very important. But essentially, the Adamic man was created uh, so that it is uh, genome would be compatible both with the cherubim angels and the seraphic components, the seraphim. So the Adamic man is sexually viable with both components. Now the cherubim and the seraphim work together. They are what you would describe as the host and they work um, in unison and they're working under a contract or under an agreement. Essentially um, the dragon which fell from heaven, which was in the Greek mythology, the Titan and Maki, uh, was the war in heaven. And basically there was a schism and this schism was was between the human element and the seraphic element and uh, this created division and then essentially um, life was replanted on the earth and this is again described in the Quran as the second creation the second creation is also referred to in um, the Greek mysteries as panspermia which is the planting of life on the earth and so this is actually something which is very interesting because life itself is equated with the angelic sailors and I think I'll go into some of those etymologies so essentially as we said before 
Mal like an angel is Mal like a sailor, and and this is a naval crew member of a vessel which is equated with an angelic sailor who is、um, correlated with heaven. But we can be a little bit more specific about this because within the Judaic mysteries, Mal like a sailor is also really a synonym of the Ben Sira. Now, who are the Ben Sira? Well, the Ben Sira are those who are born of a boat.、Um, but the word Sira, a boat, is a diptych paranomasia, so it's working on the Hebrew and Arabic wordplay. Sira, a boat, is a wordplay on the Arabic Sira, which is Sirius. So the Ben Sira are son of creation of the Ben Sira, the sons of Sirius. Now the sons of Sirius, as we said, are the angels. In particular, they are the seraphic components. So, for example, the seraphim. Where we get the etymology "serefa," which is fire, are equated with "sira." Now, the etymology of "sira" in the Arabic is coming from "sara," which is a spark. So, in other words, "sirius" is the sparkling one, and the seraphim are equated with fire, "serefa," which is fire. So the seraphim are correlated with Sirius, and again, the seraphim are synonymous with the jinn because the Arab scholars often translate the word seraph or seraphim as the jinn or genie. Now, the jinn are said to be born of fire, which again is this esoteric signifier of Sirius. Now, the seraphims. The seraphim they、um, planted life on the earth, and again it's found within the etymologies. So, for example, when we begin to break down some of the etymologies, we see that there's a connection between zar, which is an angel or an alien. The word is polymorphic. It can also mean a stranger or a visitor. So, zar, an angel, alien, stranger or visitor, is equated、uh, with the Hebrew word sira, which is a boat, as we said, which is sira, which is Sirius. Now,、um, zar, an angel, is also equated with Um, Zara to sow and Zaria the seed. Again, the implication is of creation. Hence, there's a wordplay between in,、uh, the Hebrew word Yetzira, creation,、um, Sira, a boat, and、uh, Yetzir, which is a creature. So, creation is identified with a boat. And again, the symbolism is polyglottal. This means that the symbolism translates in multiple languages, which is evidence of the artifact. Essentially, we're seeing、um, that the angels are the Ben Sira, that they're equated with、um, Zar, which is an alien or angel,、um, Zara, which is to、um, so, so Zaria, which is seed. Now, importantly,、uh, the Ben Sira, which is Sirius, which is represented as the sparkling one, which is equated with light, is equated with the Watchers. And I think that this is another important point which we need to look at: is the Watchers. So, for example, when we look at the seraphim, we see that there's a relationship between the singular word seraph, which is a non-human angel, and sofeph, which is a watcher. Now, sofeph, a watcher, is a metonym, or it's another word for erin, which is a watcher or a shining one. Again, it's a polymorphic symbol. So, in the、um, text of Amran, the erin are referred to、um, as the watchers or the shining ones, and they are said to have a face like a viper. So, they are they are equated. Like the seraphim with Sirius, another esoteric signifier of Sirius. Now the Erin are etymological to the Elohim, so we see that there's a cognate between the Elohim, which are the high ones, and Erin, which is a watcher or a shining one. But we see the same wordplay; it's polyglottal also within the Greek. So there's a cognate between Theos, a god in the Greek, Theros, a watcher, Phos, which is light. Now here we're essentially in the Greek referring to as we are in the Aramaic with a dragon, hence. The root of draken is coming from drakein, which is、um, to watch, to flash, or, or to gleam,、uh, which is from the etymology of dirk, which is to see. So the the watchers. Um, all the deities, all the seraphim, are these non-human entities which were venerated and which were worshipped and which were equated with、um, boats and vessels. And in particular, they were equated with Sirius. And Sirius is important when we go into the symbolism of the Illuminati, because the Illuminati themselves represent themselves with light, which is a signifier of Sirius. And so、uh, we can talk、uh, about the Illuminati, but essentially. The Illuminati is very ancient. The Latin word Illuminati, the illuminated ones, the enlightened ones,、um, is really a translation coming from the、um, Arabic root Axori,、um, a brother of light. Now, what's very interesting about the Axori? Again, we have this diptych paranomasi. It's a wordplay、um, in the、um, in the Aramaic of an Axari. An Axari is a brother of an angel, alien. Visitor, stranger. So, 
the um, Illuminati, they represent themselves as brothers of angels. And what's very interesting about the Illuminati is that they divide themselves into three sections. And obviously this is played out, let's say, within the symbology of the triangle. Uh, the double triangle of the Judaic star, again, is another signifier of um, three corners of a triangle times by two is three and three, which is 33. The three, 33 degrees of Freemasonry can be um, symbolized within geometry as this six-pointed star. But essentially, Essentially, uh, we're seeing that the triangle um, is related to the number three. And again, there's this, if you like, relationship in the Arabic between talat three and the Hebrew word talat, which is a worm. The worm is the signifier of the jinn. Jinn, which is um, a serpent or a worm. Um, sorry, jinn, which is a spirit, which is uh, related to the old Semitic word, jen, a serpent or a worm. And again, jen, a serpent or a worm is related to jan, which is to hide or to conceal. Now, I think what's very interesting is that the etymology is also related to Jonah, which is a shield. And this is very important when we're dealing with the scaphological tradition of these angelic ships, because another signifier of the opening wheels is a shield. And this is in, important because the... Uh, the hosts uh, represented their, um, we sh I should say that the disciparati or the deceivers, they represented the symbology of the angelic carrier with a wheel, which was a spinning wheel, ofana wheel, pana to turn or to spin, or with a type of shield as well. Now, this is important because in the ancient world, a shield wasn't only used as a guard, but it was also used as a projectile in order to um, break down fortifications, in order to sink ships. So they were like these um, giant missiles. And, and again, they can be construed to be a type of missile um, uh, or a type of projectile, which was placed into a catapult and which was flung at the enemy like a giant frisbee. Typically, these shields would have burning oil in them as well, and they would fly through the sky. And so, so when they were representing the um, um, the angelic ships, they were also representing them as a type of missile. And again, this is borne out in the etymology of an emissary and a missile. But remember that the ancient word for a missile would be a shield. And again, when we're going back into the ancient Aramaic, for example, and again, when you're looking at statues of Artemis um, and, and different deities, sometimes what you'll see is that you'll see, and particularly this is found on the Greek statues, you'll have a large shield and behind it is a serpent. Now, this is representation of a flying saucer and an alien. Now, people may say, well, that's pushing it a little bit far, Sabak. But no, it's not. Not when we begin to break down the etymologies. And again, the Greeks were typically working on diptych paranomasia, in which they were using word plays within their own language um, and playing them in the Aramaic and the Arabic. And again, this is typically what the priesthood do. So if you go... Um, if you go to church, if you're a Catholic, you'll go to church and um, everything will be in Latin. And if you go to the Latin churches, everything then goes into Greek. And if you go into the Greek churches, everything will be in Arabic. And so everything is one step removed. And this is to keep knowledge away from the masses. Uh, but going back into the symbolism of the shield, uh, you see that there's a wordplay between jinn, uh, between jinn, which is a, a spirit, which in the biblical tradition is a Ruach Elohim, and we will touch upon that in, in a moment. But we've got jinn, which is a spirit or a serpent, jana, which is to hide or to conceal. In this context, it would be connoting that which is invisible or that which is hidden. So jana to hide or to conceal, Juna, which is a shield, um, and again, the idea is that you're hidden behind a shield or, or, a shield, or you're protected um, by a shield, and then you, obviously you've got Jen, which is a serpent or a worm. So when you've got the shield which is covering the serpent, which is found within Hellenistic uh, statues, they are representing what is the seraphic host. And remember what I said before, Yahweh Seboeth, the Lord of the host. Seboeth, host, Sabar and Ami, Sefer for viper, is equated with seraph or serpent. So when we're talking about Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the host, the connotation here is, is of the seraphic host. So this is a non-human host which can be represented by the shield and by the serpent. Um, within the Greek mysteries, this would be equated with the harpies. So the etymology of harpy, for example, is apui, an abductor, which is related to erpaton, a reptile, um, apto, which is to radiate, remember, seraph or serpent in the Semitic, seraph or fire, hapto to radiate, and um, we've got oplon a shield, 
or polite as such a, uh, a soldier. But remember, the shield in the symbolism can denote both a missile, but it can also, and is closely equated with a boat or a vessel. Hence the correspondence in the Greek between opalon, a shield, and pleon, which is a boat. Uh, and so the shield is denotational of the boat, which in this respect would be an angelic carrier or an angelic ship. Wow, that was uh, incredible. Take a pause there. <laughs> yeah, no, that was it was wonderful. And uh, yes, I, of course, I read your book, so I am getting everything. And for the audience, not only do you get charts, pictures, graphics, everything, plus great text and scholarship, but at the end, Pierre has a glossary. So you can just go back and bang, bang, bang. So I get it uh, because I enjoyed the book, Holographic Culture. But Vance, I'd like to bring you in since you are the, the second listener, the second creation of the show, I guess. What do you, do you have a question for Pierre? Are you understanding everything that he's saying? Yeah, amazingly, as, as much information as there is, uh, I, I was pretty much able to follow it. But as you said, I'm a student of this stuff from a long time back. I figured out that angels and aliens uh, had a confluence and there wasn't much difference. But what I'm wondering is, um, so far we know who, and we see that history in the form of language has recorded the relationships and what they are. And I guess each, each culture takes its form of transportation and its civilization and maps it sure. to theirs, right? But um, sure. I'm wondering what our relationship, that did they create mankind? Are they friends of mankind? Are they the gardeners for a giant garden in which we're the plants? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a very in, interesting subject. I actually think that we've been planted on the earth, and I think that there are multiple worlds in which these um, architects or civil engineers, remember in the Greek, the um, creator of mankind is referred to as the demiurge. The Greek word demiurgos means public craftsman. Now, the public craftsman is an esoteric signifier of a genetic engineer. The public craftsman engineered humanity so we're dealing here with a genetic engineer as i said before there was a correspondence between zara and angel um zara zara to um, zara to sow zaria seed and again sira about yet sira which is creation again we would find a similar implication within uh, the english of um, birth um, but to birth or to more about as well which is polyformal symbolism so we're, we're finding that these signifiers are replete and again i think that these um, angelic beings that they're they, they are essentially um, a predaceous species and i think that they're trying to l keep at the um, top of the food chain and what they're doing is they're using systems of evolution which are emergent systems in order to mine intelligence and so for example they will have different planets with different species on at different levels of um, shall we say evolution and i think also they use the dialectic to try and speed up and slow down and to try and shall we say steer evolution so again conflict financial disasters pandemics these can all be used in order to speed up and slow down evolutionary cycles and they're very interested in evolutionary cycles and i think that what they're doing they are mining what we can say is perhaps what is the most important commodity within the universe which is knowledge and so they're they are interested in knowledge. But I also think that when we're dealing with this um, species, and again, we're dealing what, with what I describe as a holographic culture. And a holographic culture, they have deconstructed the waveform mechanics of reality. And so, for example, when we look at the um, biblical traditions, we find that the Elohim, the watchers, or the high ones who are described, or who are also described as the Erin, the watchers, or the shining ones, which according to the testament of Amran, had a face of a viper, so they were the seraphim. Of him. But when we look at the Ruach Elohim, which is another word for a jinn or a spirit, we are finding that they're paradoxical. So therefore, the Ruach Elohim, the high spirits, they can materialize as an Ella K, which is a high creature. Again, the Aramaic word K, which is um, uh, an animal in the Hebrew, Kaya, an animal, um, the Ella K is a high creature. Today, we would say an extraterrestrial biological entity. Now, the terminology an Ella K is translated by biblical scholars as, um, um, as a living God. But again, the, the translation of, um, of, of, let's say, a high creature or a living God 
if you like, they are polymorphic. They are synonymous. They are one and the same. Now, when we begin to look at the LRK, there is, is some interesting word plays, and there it's really useful to go into some of those word plays. So, for example, we find that there's a relationship with the LRK and the modern Hebrew word Kezar. Now, Kezar, K meaning um, living, Zar, which is an a, um, alien. Uh, the old word was an alien, stranger, um, visitor. So, angel so an angel or an alien so the modern hebrew word kezar uh, a spaceman encodes the lk which is a high creature and it also encodes the aramaic word zar which is an alien stranger or visitor so we're seeing that there is this correspondence if you like between the elohim which are represented as the lk a high creature and then the, the paradoxical state of the ruach elohim which is basically their dematerialized form and the way that they can dematerialize is that they're using the waveform mechanics of reality. So as uh, many of your viewers will be aware, within um, reality, you have basically a particle. But the particle can also be seen as a, a waveform. This is uh, relative. It's according to the observer. And they have deconstructed the mechanics of waveform reality. Now, within Greek philosophy, uh, this would be um, the, um, if you like, the dichotomy between the universal forms, which is the implicated order, and then the um, explication of the explicative order, uh, which is a particularization of the form in the platonic philosophy, the particular form. So you see that there's a relationship between uh, the um, spirit, which is the waveform, and then the materialization of um, the physical being. And, and again, we're finding similarities between the Greek word nous, which is mind, pneuma, which is the spirit. But, but again, it's very interesting because there's also a correspondence with nous, which is a boat. And this is because the Ruach Elohim, uh, their vessels could dematerialize. And again, the Ruach Elohim, they were a type of jinn, and so they could communicate telepathically. And we're finding that relationship also within, let's say, within the jinn who are described as the Karin. Now, the Karin is closely related. The Karin means a companion. It's closely related to the Erin, which are the watchers or the shining ones. But again, Karin is coming from the root of carry which means telepathic so the karen they can insinuate themselves upon the human mind and we're finding that these um, etymologies are also played out with the jinn because the etymology of majun which is madness in in arabic uh, means to conceal the mind but it's coming from jana to hide or to conceal which is the etymology of the jinn so once the parameters of the mind once they begin to dissolve or break down uh, then one is then able to see the jinn and we're finding also the same is found within the latin again this is a, a polyglottal symbol so it's a wordplay which work, works also within the latin we find that there's a correspondence between the daemon and demens which is to be out of one's mind in modern english we would say dementia so dementia with dementia and, and again even within the ufological tradition if you look very closely you can find examples of um, old people who are suffering from dementia who are having experiences with these entities which are often described as looking like gray beings and i think it's very interesting that when we look at the word plays of the grays we're finding the same correspondences as with the deities and the angels so for example with the grays grays is a word play on gaze which is to watch glaze which is a uh, gloss or luster but again in the greek theos a, theos a god theros a watcher phos which is light in the semitic uh, we've got uh, the Erin, which is a watcher, or a, sh a shining one. So again, we're, we're seeing that there are these correspondences. And, and I think one of the, um, uh, uh, the esoteric signifiers of shining, as I said, when you look at symbols, you need to look at them as being multifaceted. And again, this is known in Arabic discourse as Wudju al-Quran, which is the forgotten recitation. Uh, Wudju, um, as this appended meaning of a facet. So again, this idea of a faceted interpretation of the Quran. But again, um, would you also means a polymorphic word. And again, the idea is that the Quran is written in polymorphic language, in multiple languages, in, in words which have multiple meanings. And again, this is implicit of an initiatory tradition. And, and this is something which has been concealed and hidden. And this is something which is hidden behind 
what I describe as the scaphological tradition, which is the the studies of angelic ships within religion and mythology. And again, even within the Islamic um, treaties, for example, within the calligraphy, you will often see that the name of Allah or the verses of the Quran and the Surah are often represented um, in the calligraphy, stylized as a ship or a boat, which would be evidence of the um, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the Host. And again, sometimes they also appear within a cog as well. And this is because the opening wheels were often depicted within symbolism as an interlinking wheel or as a cog and tooth. And again, when you go back into uh, the ufology uh, and when you look at um, um, books on ufology, you begin to realize that the um, craft itself, and this was described in Frank Scully's 1950s book, um, I, the book escapes me now, but essentially uh, he wrote about how a, how a UFO had been deconstructed and it was made out of a series of cogs. Now this is esoteric and is found both within the Bible um, in terms of the opening wheels because they were a series of cogs. And this is something which is um, interesting because the opening wheels were also described in the book of Ezekiel as the work of the Lord. And this work uh, can also, the word work can also be translated as a, a construction. So it's a construction of the of the Lord. It is something which is made. Um, again, the word construction, Messiah, um, is, is used um, to denote something which is made or constructed. And the priesthood, they would hide these vessels and they saw them as being um, very powerful weapons. And again, within the Greek mysteries, you have got um, a, a deity, for example, and the um, um, deity would carry a shield, um, which is an aegis. But again, uh, the shield of a deity is related to the Hebrew word eger, which is the helm of a boat or a ship. And the um, aegis um, is this esoteric signifier of a deity and his vessel, which was equated with um, Apollon, a shield, Cleone, which is a boat. So we're seeing again that the shield is this signifier of these circular or these elliptical vessels, which were construed to be like type of weapon and again even when we're dealing within the roman mysteries as well we have um, the shield uh, which fell from heaven um, which in in the roman mysteries um, you've got um, newman and but yeah that's that in itself is another subject but um, essentially the shield is a signifier of these ships or these vessels so i'll just pause there a little moment and i'll give you an opportunity to catch your breath and and to ask a few <laughs> questions <laughs> Uh, Vance, do you have uh, any more questions? Uh, uh, about 50 of them. <laughs> I have two. I have one quick one, and then I'll let Vance, because, again, this is more sure. Vance's strength. But, for example, again, I'm going back to the charts because they really helped me. But you break down their powers and the powers, for example, the Elohim, a little more powerful yeah. than the engineers in Prometheus because they are time travelers and precogs. They can manipulate sure. matter. I mean, how can you Correct. go against that? But if mm. uh, these beings know of your work or the work of John Keel or Jacques Vallée or so mm. forth, are they fine with it that you're kind of exposing the men behind the curtain? In terms of, you mean the disciplinarity in terms of me just talking about this secret knowledge, which has been classified? Exactly. Yeah. Or John Keel or Jacques Vallée or, I mean, maybe Carl Jung got close. You know what I mean? Do they, they, they're not worried about this. Well, again, if you look at the nuts and bolts I, hypothesis, the nuts and bolts is an esoteric wordplay on boats, bolts and boats. So again, we're seeing that there is this type of hidden discourse within ufology. And again, Adamski, Adam and Sky, you know, the Adamic man originated from the sky. And in fact, we can say that the Adamic man is equated with Mahadim, which is Mars, Adam, which is red, Adam and Adama. So that Adam, or which is the red earth, Adama, is Adam which is equated with Eden. So Eden is equated with Mahadim, which is Mars, where Adam originates. No, no, I say, yeah, I don't think you're understanding my question. Sorry. I, in in I ancient times, they were worshipped as gods. Sure. And then it sort of fell the Christian God or Allah became supreme. And now we live in the age of science where we can look at the stars and so forth. Yeah. My saying is they personally don't mind if people start noticing them that we're exposing their secrets with this interview or the work of other ufologists? Well, I, again, I think you're finding that within the prophetic tradition in terms of yeah, uh, the apocalypse, because you've got Calypto, which is to reveal or to disclose. So disclosure is the apocalypse. So with the advent of computer, in a sense, the genie is out of the bottle, because before the computer, <laughs> yeah. we had 
academia and academia was a closed system. And then you add, well, you add the alternative media, but again, that was a closed system through publishing. Now we have much more an open um, forum in terms of in which we can talk about this on the computer. And again, we've got more intellectuals. So we just don't have the intellectuals from Oxford those who were initiated, but we're also we've got the intellectuals who are bringing in new and fresh information, such as myself, such as the scaphological tradition. So I think that this in itself is inevitable, and I think it's also a part of our evolution. I do know within the biblical um, story of the Tower of Babel, um, man um, began to speak the same language, and again they challenged the Elohim, and the Elohim then scattered them across the earth. So again, and even in the Book of Enoch as well, um, Elohim describes how when men began to write that it, that they were really distraught about the fact that men were beginning to become knowledgeable. So again, I think that when you look within the Illuminati, uh, this is something which divides themselves, and I think that the Illuminati themselves. Um, although they have this coalition, it's a bit of a shaky coalition. It's a coalition in which is very antagonistic, and that really goes into the three, le- the th- uh, three levels of the Illuminati, which are the tripartite, and these um, divisions between, uh, quickly, I- I'll just summarize it, and then I'll let you Please get Please do, yeah, question. it makes sense. So, for example, when we're talking about the tripartite Illuminati, we're describing Ishaman, Esh, which is fire, uh, which is the human element. We've got the seraph, serepha, which is fire, which is a non-human element. And then we've got the neophytes. The neophytes are this grafted lineage. So we've got neophyte, the newly planted, fruit on a plant, fot, which is light. Again, the neophyte really has this connotation of this grafted bloodline. And in the ancient world, uh, they talked about the grafting of bloodlines. It could also be described as a stitched bloodline or a woven bloodline. And so these are used to denote what is essentially in English we would describe as a sky on a Skyon is a noble family, but a Skyon is also um, a shrub which is easily grafted. And, and so we're finding the same symbology. So there are antagonisms within the Illuminati. There are particularly antagonisms between the uh, humanist element and the seraphic component. And yet again, you're finding this, let's say, within the Greek symbolism of Plato's Republic and also Zenos's Republic, which followed later. Again, the word Zenos um, is a stranger or an alien. And again, Xenos was used as a metonym to describe uh, an angel or an alien. And so Zenon's um, treatise was describing how the, the common man could actually um, um, become heads of states. And this was a very controversial idea. And it's basically, it caused a split. It caused what we would describe as the Republic. And the Republic is pretty much behind every civil war uh, we've ever had on the planet. Because the Republic is essentially, do we have mediators, which are the royal grafted bloodlines who mediate between heaven and earth? Or do men represent themselves? And, um, and, and this is a fundamental question, and it's a fundamental question uh, which has been playing out for hundreds of, of years, in fact, thousands of years. So, Yeah, it seems like it's uh, really happening now, <laughs> the, the big battle on the planet, yes. right, between, you know, central, enlightened, you know, probably connection sure. to these guys. Uh, it's interesting. Do you think that um, there's a parallel between the biblical concept of you know the fallen angels versus the good angels and this rift inside the illuminati inside the high ones and so forth i've never looked at it that way but i think that when you frame it in in that way then the discourse itself is self-evident and yes there obviously is this um division and i think that this actually goes into government and it's actually useful for us to discuss some of the etymologies of government because in the Hebrew tradition, when you look at the etymology of government, you, you see that there's a relationship between Sinten, which is two, Satan, which is the division between two. So Satan, which is the adversary or the opponent. Uh, opponent. But the um, word Satan is used in the Old Testament. It's polymorphic. It can also mean an adversary of a political party. And this is important because the political parties are adversarial and they're oppositional. This reflects the dialectic, which is the seraphim cherubim dialectic, but it also reflects government. And so there's a correspondence between Satan, which is um, a political opponent of a political party, Shilton, which is government, Sultan, which is, um, again, a royal bloodline, and Sultan, 
Tan or Tanim, which is a dragon. And so, and Tahen, which is to gleam, which again is related to the shining ones, uh, which is equated with Sof, Ephel, Watch, or a Seraph. So once again, we're seeing that the fallen angels have insinuated themselves within the uh, governments and that the royal structures um, themselves, so you've got the upper house, which represents heaven, lower house, which represents commons. Commons is a Latin word meaning hairy. In this respect, this would be the mammalian or would represent <laughs> one who is common. Wow, Harry. Yeah. You know, um, how about, the, uh, speaking of the Bible, the um, sure. Genesis, you know, chapters yes. 1 and 2, and there's the serpent, right, the seraphim and so forth, sure. and then there's uh, sure. Jehovah, but it seems like those two entities are both, maybe this comes back to what I just asked you about, uh, it seems like they're sure. both transcendent of the humans, you know, Adam and Eve are running around. So uh, how does that relate, the Adam and Eve story with the serpent and Jehovah? Okay, right, that's a very good question. And I think, well, first of all, um, we can say that the bloodline of Eve was supplanted. And again, this is going back into the idea of the fall of creation. The fall of creation is really, in the Greek tradition, the corruption of the Anthropos. The corruption of the Anthropos uh, was the, the Anthropos was the prototypical races, and they all became corrupted by genetic engineering. So we see that in the biblical story, getting back to the question, Awa Eve is a wordplay on the old Semitic word Awim, which is a serpent. And so the bloodline of Eve is equated with the serpent, and the bloodline of the serpent is typically matriarchal. But again, we're finding similar wordplays with Adam and Adon, which is a lizard. So again, the bloodline of Adam was also, by implication, supplanted by the reptile. Within the, star, within the biblical stories, this would be Jacob and Esau, Jacob, which is um, to supplant, um, Cab, which is a coil, Keb, which is a serpent, Esau means the hairy one. So again, um, Jacob and Esau is this seraphim cherubim dialectic. But I think oh. in uh, relation to your Yeah, I think in relation to your question, though, I think that this is very important because as I mentioned before, Yahweh himself is the Lord of the seraphic host, and therefore he is represented as a seraphim. So I will just recap on the etymologies of um, Sabaoth, and then I will go over some of the etymologies of Yahweh, and how his name actually encodes a serpent. So, for example, as I mentioned before, there's a correspondence between Sabaoth, um, the angelic host, Sabar and Ami, Sephira, Seraph, um, seraph, which is um, the non-human angel. So Yahweh Sabaoth is the Lord of the Seraphic host. But also when we're looking at the name uh, Yahweh, Yahweh is um, transliterated according to um, Bullinger in his um, um, appendices of the um, Bible. We find that Yahweh is transliterated as Eya. Now Eya is a word play on Aya to be. To be is another reference to an entity. Entitas is to be, so he's a type of entity. But Aya is also a word play in the Syrian word, Aya, which is a serpent, Arabic, Ayal, which is a goblin. So Yahweh, Sabaoth, um, or Yahweh, is um, equated to, with uh, um, Aya, which is to be, Aya, which is a serpent, Ayal, which is a goblin. Now, the other name for Yah Yahweh is El Shaddai, Almighty God. El, which is Almighty Shaddai. Now, Shaddai is coming from the root of shed, which is a goblin, ghost, ghoul, or jinn. So um, El Shaddai, he's the Lord of the host. In particular, he's the Lord of the spiritual host. In fact, we could say that he's the Lord of the Shedim, which is a jinn, goblin, ghost, or ghoul, shed in the singular. So Yahweh, Yahweh Sabaoth himself is representational of the serpent, and, the, and this is the seraphic component. So in the Bible, the serpent plants mankind upon the earth. And again, the, the tree is very symbolic because the tree contains the serpent. The serpent was said to be a subtle creature. The subtle creature is this jinn, the Ruach Elohim, the high ones. But we're also seeing that the tree is symbolic of a family tree, and the family tree is important because it denotes the grafting of bloodlines. And this is particularly important when we go into symbology uh, related to the king and the noble bloodline, which is said to be born of a boat. So, for example, noble is related to navel. Nobilis is to know, um, but we're seeing that there's a correspondence um, with um, navel within the etymology, the transition between the B and the V morphology, which would be the Bensira, those who are born of a boat. So they represent their family tree, either with a shield, Oplon, um, 
up on a shield, play on, play on, which is a boat. But remember, we said that the shield is a symbol of um, a heavenly boat or a heavenly vessel, which was a type of missile equated to an emissary or a messenger, which is an angel. Um, so we're seeing that, um, yes, that the serpent and the bloodlines of the serpent are equated to the king. I, I think I just... It, this is a really important point. So I think it's a really good point in, in fact that we can explore this relationship between the king and the angelic lineage. So for example, in the Semitic languages, we're seeing there's a correspondence between Malak an angel, Malak a sailor, Melek a king. In English, we would say kingship. Kingship refers to um, one who is born of a boat. In the Greek tradition, sabasma, which is an emperor, is, is a wordplay or a diptych paranomasia on saboth, which is the host. But again, also when we're looking in the Semitic, we're seeing that there's wordplays between the um, Semitic word Amir, a prince, Amara, Amara, which is a fleet or a vessel. Again, we've got an archon, an angel or a ruler, Olkas, which is a ship or a vessel. We've got in the Arabic Sarif, which is a lord or a noble, which is a wordplay on Seraph and Safina, which is a boat. So we're seeing that there is this correspondence with lordship, which is denotational of this angelic lineage, which can be represented as a family tree, i.e. one who is grafted, or can be represented um, as a shield, again, implicit of the Ben Sira, one who is born of a boat. Well, we are at the end of this very excellent interview. First, I'd like to say goodbye to Vance. Thanks for uh, keeping us company, Vance. Thank you, Vance, for your questions. They were very pertinent. Oh, my pleasure. And, you know, it's been a great ride on the ship. <laughs> and I'm so, thank you. And I'm sorry that I'm... I'm, I'm I'm sorry that I uh, spoke so much that I hardly gave uh, the host chance, if you like, to oh, ask questions. No, 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 no. We love it. This is what, yeah. it was important. This is what the audience wants. Yes, agreed. Right. And, and if um, the audience needs to find out more about you, where can they, where can they go? We'll have it on the show notes, but uh, yeah, okay. for those listening in audio. Okay, I've got um, Pierre Sabak books, um, and that takes you to my website. So if you're interested in my work, you can uh, buy a book, Holographic Culture or the Murder of Reality. Just to summarize my book, Holographic Culture looks at the scaphological tradition, which is the study of angelic ships uh, within the religious and mythological tradition. The Murder of Reality is really a study of the serpent agena, the serpent race, and particularly the cult symbology of the symbol within the uh, mystery religions. Uh, sometimes I get asked from viewers if they say well which book do i buy because um, i can only afford one book or um i just want to if you like dip in and, and see if i'm interested in your work and so i always say holographic culture now the reason why i say that is that first of all holographic culture um the ideas i, I think are, are condensed very well and uh, secondly it's um it's an extra 100 pages, so it's nearly 600 pages, and it's, it, it's, it's a bigger book. And I just think that it lays out very neatly and very concisely uh, the angelic tradition, this naval tradition, which is the classical tradition. Class is a naval fleet, which is classified. And again, classes which is compartmentalized or which is um, broken into pieces because it's this um, compartmentalized tradition. So the naval tradition, which is the angelic tradition, which can be found in holographic culture. Oh, and by the way, YouTube as well. Just if you are interested, I, I do YouTube videos. I am having problems at the moment uploading them because they work on the back end of my channel, but they don't work on the front end. Uh, my videos are silent on the front end. I'm going to have to speak to youtube about that and try and sort that out but if you're interested i've got over 100 videos on youtube discussing the scaphological tradition and you can find that under ps back on youtube so please um if you subscribe that would be brilliant and i i look forward to um um yeah just um people watching my videos and if people have got questions they can leave questions and i, I do try and answer some but because i do get a lot of um people writing to me it's not always possible to answer every email but you know I, I i do try and make an effort and do try and um help the people who are really in need of help and have got questions wonderful you heard it here and check out his work and well pierre uh, we appreciate you coming on am by to discuss your wonderful book the holographic culture and uh, good luck with your future works we look forward to talking about them Thank you. I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. And there you have it, my beloved truth seekers. The first part of our interview with Pierre Sabac. Feeling cosmic? Feeling otherworldly? 
You will in our second part, where we continue delving into that war in heaven all the aliens are dealing with, and more on how we forgot this shit. Pierre will discuss the issue of language and how it was manipulated to control our behavior. Pierre will talk about Gnosticism in general, including who is really the Demiurge and his Archons, and what is the Pleroma. We'll deal with alien abduction, more problems with modern ufology, and how to fix them, C.G. Jung's view on UFOs, and what is going on today with the government leaking about extraterrestrial sightings, and much, much more. Feeling cosmic? Feeling otherworldly? So become an AB Prime member or Patreon at Patreon for the full space oddity. It really helps grow this red pill cafeteria. Only $6.99 a lunar cycle. You won't find this Gnostic content or many of our guests anywhere in cyberspace or even meat space. Damning your soul has never been this cheap, but you'll get your spirit back. Membership includes full access to the archives with more than 14 years of high quality interviews. You'll also get an invitation to the Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Facebook group and the Discord channel where past guests like Adrian Smith, Scott Smith, Edward Pandemonium, Joanna Cuyava, Tim Freak, and Chris Bennett hang out there, among many others. All part of some mind-expanding conversations. Even support in the form of some shekels to PayPal or the US mail really, really helps. I also have an Amazon wish list as I always need equipment in this universe of entropy. Don't forget me books like Voices of Gnosticism or other Voices of Gnosticism. The show has grown to the point advertisers want to appear, but they're rejected as I only work for you and only you. You can do so many wonders, I just know it and are so full of potential and the ability to go beyond the stars. Give the alien god back his wisdom and heal a dying universe. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self. Hello and goodbye, as always.